and you guys seem like you're okay with the level of content we're at right now, right? Is everyone, no one's bleeding from their eyes, which I, it, it, it takes, I, I can't get away with this at most shows I go to. Like we would have already, people would have left. So it, that's kind of why I like this, because you guys are kind of into it. So, you know, we were talking about those type extensions. You want to make one? Sure. Just for shits and grins? Okay. Um, let's do this then. Yeah. Could you t actually cast that to an XML object and then just copy the object and do whatever you want? Could I, could I read the, the text, cast it to XML, right. programmatically modify it, yep. and then resave it? it? Yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can also just open Notepad. All right, let's save this. Um, not really. That's a lot of code, man. Okay. Here it is, types. So, so it's just what Betsy Ross used to do. Let's grab types, type, 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 type. Okay, copy, paste. Types. Do you notice that once you save this file with a PS1 XML file name extension, PowerShell will try to do some basic parsing, rather the ISE will try and do some basic parsing. Like if I don't close that tag properly, it gets the little, little squiggle and it'll actually say end tag not closed, idiot. So what did we name our, our object? No, my awesome object because that's it's inappropriate. All right, we're not gonna, well, heck, let's do an alias property. That's a cool trick. So now we're gonna have a machine property. We're gonna have a machine property, a real property, not a column header, with the same value as our existing computer name. Which means if you've got some known situation where you're going to be piping this object to another commandlet and you need to make the data line up, this is another way to do it. This is a nice declarative way to do it. Because it's not really Cody. So that's kind of cool. This shows up as an alias and get member. This will show up as an alias property and get member. Yep. Um, well, you, you can't just customize, you can't just put alias properties to, oh, no, I see what you're saying. So you're saying, so if you're going to make a fake yeah, column yeah. header, shouldn't you also just put an underlying alias property there? Yeah, just that so depends on how nice of a person you are. Well, the, name. the alias property thing can be used to do that. So I'm not, and I'll show you another trick for that. But with the AD object, what you could do. Let's just go off on every possible tangent. Get a. <laughs> I don't care. Um, I could do this. Um, I forget how you do these exactly. Uh, I, I think I'm probably going to get this wrong. No, it's name first. Name is, is uh, let's say you wanted it to be computer name, and then I think the reference goes in there and you would make it name or CN or whatever. You could do that and then hit it with a pass through and then it would come out the other end. It is nearly infinitely faster to type. Right, and do this trick. And and in that case, you could add a type extension for the AD computer type. The problem is, I don't know if there's already a type extension for it, and they don't combine. It's not like Voltron. So you, you have to, if yours goes in first, yours wins. If yours is in after the existing one, yours is never seen. So you'd have to see. But if there's not a type extension for that type already, then yeah, this is another way that you could pull that off. Um, so I'm after a script method. I'm just going to search for one. Oops, no, 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 wrong, wrong button. There we go. 
Copy. Paste. So within this file, dollar this refers to the current object, right? It refers to, to, to me, which is what this is being added to. So I'm running test connection against my computer name property in quiet mode, which will return a true or a false, right? Um, we now need to go modify my, remember this guy, manifest, because I need to add that type. And that's not right. Right? And that's what I called that? Yep. All right. Remove module on class, get OS. Uh, let's do this in a couple steps. <clears throat> let's make sure it still works. Okay. So I put those in a variable, right? Pipe it to GM. There's my pingable script method at the bottom of the list. Yeah. There's my machine alias property at the top of the list. X zero pingable. <coughs> it's cool. <coughs> right? So we've dynamically added code where before there was none. Uh, and you can do that not only to, so, and here's the thing, when you're producing the object yourself, there's an argument that I could have also done that in my actual script here using add member. But the point of the ETS is that you can add stuff to code that isn't yours. You can extend other objects, not just the ones you created. So it's a really, really neat set of techniques. Assuming it hasn't been done before. But if it has been done before, then you have access to the XML and you can certainly just go copy it and then add your own stuff to it so that you still get whatever functionality was there before plus whatever you've added. So the, well, what about the execution policy and signing and stuff like that? So what well, no, I mean, what I'm saying is you would just go into the XML file where it defined whatever exists, copy that section out, oh, okay. put it in your own, add your stuff to it, and then let yours be loaded first in the stack. So you added a method to all types, which means you probably added it to object. Okay. If you extend system.object, everything is born. That's okay, like the, yeah. the ultimate womb. Everything comes from that. Okay, maybe that's right. Yeah. Me? Questions? Can, see Can you see what? The method that you put in the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, that's what I expected. I was like, dollar, this is, dollar this is given to you. It's kind of like dollar sign under bar. Okay. And in fact, in a, in a just and perfect world, it would be dollar sign under bar. But whoever coded this didn't know that. So it's dollar sign this. Every other programming language in the world, it would be dollar sign this. So it just represents the, the object itself, the object that is being extended. Can you add parameters? Add per parameters. So it's just pingable. You can't pass anything else. Oh, no, no, no. You can add parameters. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to go hunt for an example of one. I don't remember the syntax right off, but you can add parameters. Same with the return type. Yeah. Uh, we, we call them arguments. Uh, and I don't know if you can define a return type or not on a script method. You can have a code method which is a little bit different and more complex that lets you get into that stuff. Where's the help for this? Where's the help for this? You are funny, <laughs> funny. <laughs> Buy my book. 
PowerShell in depth. Oh, in depth. Okay. This is not a formally officially documented anywhere. Okay. I'm like, not something like this. Like, where would I find this? this um, you wouldn't. No. You read my book. Perfect. I had to reverse engineer it. Yeah, they're very lightweight. They talk more about how to load them and, and a lot less about what all goes on inside. At any given time, they could change this. Yeah, except they'd be breaking everything in the universe because they're not, they being the Microsoft PowerShell team, they're not the only ones who've, who've taken dependencies on this now. Lots of other product teams inside Microsoft has also. So they'd be, they'd be annoying a great many people. So I, this isn't going to change. There's no reason for it to. They could certainly extend it, right? They could add more capabilities to it. Um, but generally speaking, the team has been incredibly averse to taking things away, even when we wish they would. They leave it there because they don't want to create a breaking change, which I respect. So, and your type how, yeah, however, comma, the problem with, so the question is, <laughs> why would you do this instead of a class in V5? And the reason is that this works, whereas classes outside the context of DSC, remember that classes in V5 were created for DSC. Everything outside of DSC has very raw edges. For example, there's no way to just instantiate your custom class by using its type name because there's no central registry that tells the shell where the heck your script is. This works all the way back to PowerShell v1. And it works automatically without any, wor any work on your part. So yeah, programmatically, it's great. Let's take an existing class, let's inherit from it, and then extend it and add stuff. That's very, very you know, object-oriented. That's, that's wonderful except it doesn't actually work all that well yet. Maybe someday it will. Um, if you're comfortable enough with C Sharp that you would, you know, you would see it as an, as an object or as, as that approach, I would get myself a copy of Visual Studio and extend the class and compile it to a DLL and call it a day because it'll run faster. Good questions. Keep them, keep them coming. All right. Okay, so I want to get back to our, our scripty bit here. Um, have we done everything to this that, that you can think of us doing to it? What's that? Oh, we're not logging the errors. You know, thank you. You, if I had prizes, you would get one. See that? That variable exists outside of my function. That makes it a module level variable. I am going to immediately go back over to my, I don't know why I don't have my uh, manifest open over here. I'm gonna go back over to my manifest, go down to the bottom. Let's get the name of this dude. Copy it to the clipboard, go back over here find my list of variables to export. It's set to export all. Let's just go ahead and give it one explicitly. I could leave it set to all, but I do like listing things out. It does make it a little bit faster if it's in the manifest that way. So let's do that. And now let's actually use that thing. I'm going to create a second parameter. Here we go. Parameter. Mandatory. Man, let's not make it mandatory. I'll show you why. String. Error log file path equals that. So this isn't mandatory, meaning you do not have to specify it. But if you don't specify it, it will inherit whatever the value of that module level variable is. Everyone with me there? All right, because this is cool. So in the begin block, now you can completely argue for several ways to do what I'm about to do. And it's just based on kind of how you want to run your processes. That's kind of not important. What I'm going to do is uh, remove item, 
at error log file path with a force and an error action silently continue. No, it's okay. It's okay because the main error that could happen is file not found, in which case mission accomplished, right? Now, it's completely possible I could get an access denied, but honestly, I would rather that access denied blow up later because that, that's, a, a, that's not a handleable condition. That's like, that's an actual problem that I'm gonna have to look into and solve. So I, I, I kind of want that to explode. So we're gonna do that. And then down here in our catch, uh, we are, go real quick, up here in the begin, errors happened equals false, okay? You'll see why in a sec. Uh, down here in the begin, or my, my catch, there we are, catch. Uh, let's take the current computer name, out file to whatever my error log file path is with an append, yeah? And we are gonna say errors happened is true. So that in my end, right warning, oops, I should put an if around that, right? If errors happened, do you guys notice that I do that habitually? I should point it out. Open, enter, enter, close, up tab. I don't even notice I do it anymore and it keeps me from ever not closing a construct. And it makes sure I tab, because people who don't tab are pedophiles. <laughs> right warning. Yes? Now, look what happens. Look what happens on my variable drive. Where did I put it? What the heck did I name it? Don log preference. Well, that's not good. It means it didn't export. Remove module. I'm not sure if I saved my manifest. And I'm just gonna change it back to that for right now. Save. I don't know why it's not in there. Oh, you know what? I have an export module member in the script that's preventing that from being seen, but that's fine. So let's just go ahead and run get OS info. Uh, computer name, DC, not online, win81, does not exist. And I'll just leave it like that. I'm not gonna specify that logging thing, but I am gonna turn on verbose. Fun story, I was at a client one time. Uh, two fun stories, if you want the second one, it's totally unrelated, but it's hilarious. <laughs> the first one's related, I, I did this, and I just used the first three computers, DC, not online, win81, and all three worked. I'm like, <laughs> So I did it again and I hit her and it worked. I was on their network and they had, because I was on their classroom machine, there was a computer called Not Online. <laughs> They're like, oh, we think there might be a computer with that name. What, why, why, why would, why would there be, a, why? So here's our error text. This is our error warning. We got it. And if I do a get content on C errors.txt, I get a list of one computer name per line which is super useful for piping right back to my command to try again. Neat, right? Um, do you want the, the totally off-tangent story about being at a customer site? Does anyone work for a bank? Okay, just do this. Put your... <laughs> so I'm at a bank. Maybe I shouldn't say the name of it. Uh, it's in Iowa, though, I think. Sure. Anyway, we're, we're there, and I'm doing a class, and I, I, I always send off, like, the specs of, you know, here's what the lab environment needs to have. I just said, like, everybody just needs a virtual machine that's a DC for the stuff we're going to cover in your class. Just, we'll do it right on the server. Don't worry about a client. Just do that. And they're like, okay. 
So we get to the second day of class and we're really starting to dig in. I'm like, okay, run this command and I give them a command and it's supposed to retrieve all the user accounts in the directory. I'm like, okay, you ran that. So now they're like, well, hang on, it's still running. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, you have like 20,000 names. I'm like, oh, oh, you guys like cloned off a domain controller. Well, that's kind of cool because it's going to give us some data to work with. Like, no, we're just all RDP'd into a DC. Stop. Everyone stop. <laughs> Everyone type log off. Take a break. What is wrong with you? I'm going to go transfer all my money out of this bank. That's a, a terrible idea. Yeah, I don't, oh, because of the command in there, right? So anyway, you can make these module level variables that show up when you import the module and go away when you export the module. And you can use them as preference variables so that you can set some sensible default value, let someone change it, and it would then have a cascading effect and change everything else that used that in all of my functions in that module. So a very cool technique. Is that the only time I approve of module level variables? I don't like them. You, you have to use it to store state information sometimes, like maybe a global connection that a bunch of your, your things are going to use. You just, it gets a little bit messy, so you've got to be a little bit careful with it. I typically would prefer that any piece of information that my function needs get to it only via a parameter. And if you look, I stuck with that here, didn't I? The information is being given to my function by a parameter. I have just I've defaulted it elsewhere. My function is not directly accessing my preference variable. So the function is still self-contained. This is a, an, an okay pattern. If I were to just come down here to the bottom and at my out file, if I were to directly use the preference variable there, that would be bad. For one, there's no way to override that on a per run basis, which I can do the way I've set it up. And it means, and this is important, it would mean that my function would be relying on information from outside its own scope and that way leads to madness. You will never get it debugged if you start using that approach. Cool? Okay, all right. Let's, is there anything else that we didn't do to this that you want to do? I feel that we've got everything. Somebody read my book real quick and tell me if... No help. No help. Yeah, I know. We talked about that. I just don't want to. I have a question about the log. Would you really recommend writing the log called errors.txt? Or what, what would you recommend as far as like a specific tool writing to a log file somewhere? Um, so what would I recommend for uh, writing to a log file? I actually, in, in most of my like production use modules, um, I have a separate PS1 file that I usually include that has a logging function. And I just let all of them use that. Uh, and that function exposes a couple of module level preference variables that default it to logging to a file and they give it a file name. But it can be switched to log to an event log, and then obviously the file name can be changed as well. So it's, it's kind of this big multi-purpose logging function that I wrote that I use in a lot of different places. Because sometimes it, it's easier to have it in a file. Sometimes it's, it's more long-term supportable to have it in an event log, and so that way it just does everything. So what happens if you're trying to uh, do something like that where you, you, need to, you need to log it in three places? You gotta log it in the file system, log it on the screen, and then you want to send an email with just what was during that run, but your log file you're saving to is appended to all the time. Uh, well, so there's a couple of things. So what would I do, because the log file is appended to all the time, that's why at the beginning I delete the log file. Yeah, but I want it uh, appended to every time I run it. Well, then do, do that. But don't complain that that's what's happening. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, it's, no. So there's a couple of things. Um, this big function I've got has a bunch of switches, right? Switch one, which is defaulted to on, means log to file. And then you give it a file name, and it's got a default for that. There's another switch that also makes it log to an event log. And whatever you give it as a log message, it returns back to you as its output. 
So I can then recapture that into a variable in my, my actual working function to mail it off later if that's what I want to do. Or, or to add it together for a finalized email. Which is like if you want to concatenate a bunch of stuff for then, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not a, a huge fan of mailing off log files, but I, I understand there's some situations where it's the best way to pull it off. Yeah. You say you include it. I'm really curious how you sort of package or manage that relative to Bob. You mean, how do I prevent having multiple copies of it floating around the universe? Yeah. I don't. You got to keep in mind that, that my main use case was delivering stuff to customers. And so whatever I delivered to them would, would be one module, and this would get copied into it. Okay. Um, and I would never fuss with that copy again. That would be their problem. Okay. Yep. So if you were in an environment, say, we had a bunch of different modules in the enterprise, and you do have some shared things so, like this. What do you so if, if I was if I if I had a bunch of modules within my organization that I wanted to all consume that, I would make it its own standalone external function and and reference it from the module manifest as a required module. Okay. And I might reference it by path so I could pull it off of a file share. Do you guys have file servers still? Is that a thing? Yeah, we use it for our map drives. Yeah, map drives, right. <laughs> yeah, because login scripts. Because login scripts, yes, the tape drives. Um, so yeah, I would just in my manifest, I would under nested modules maybe, say also I have to have this one and that would cause it to be loaded. So yeah, instead of bundling it in, I would treat it separate. I have a fun story about login scripts too, you wanna hear that? Anybody from the East Coast? What was the phone company in like the mid-Atlantic area before it was Verizon? After 9X, Bell Atlantic, right? Because Bell Atlantic bought 9X. So who was from the Bell Atlantic service area? Remember who the spokesperson was for a long time? Deep voice, big black guy, James Earl Jones. So we, I worked for Bell Atlantic. I was a network manager. Um, so we thought it would be really cool if our login scripts that mapped our drives uh, said, welcome to Bell Atlantic. <laughs> it was kind of cool, right? So we spent about an hour calling information so we could get a really clean, you know, do 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 welcome to Bell Atlantic. And we finally got it. And we're, we had some migration happening or something. So it's like three in the morning and we're all punch drunk. Uh, and so we're doing this. And you know what else he did the, the voice for famously, right? Well, CNN, sure, but Darth Vader mostly. <laughs> And so it's possible that we came up with, welcome to Bell Atlantic, the dark side of the force. <laughs> so our CEO at the time was one of these guys, uh, and this, I worked for a, a subsidiary unit of, of Bell. And uh, he's one of these guys that would have his administrative assistant print his emails, and he would scribble a response, and she would go back and do a send as, uh, send on behalf, right? Because telecommunications company, right? Why, why would you not? So, we didn't think he had a computer or that it had speakers, uh, but both, in fact, uh, were true. It's so Monday morning, he, we're like, you know, bleary-eyed because we were there until 3 a.m. Sunday or something like that. We're, we're rolling into work. His head has exploded and, you know, twisted around sideways and he's screaming and everything else. We're, stop, stop, stop. It's just a virus. We've got tools. We can take care of that. We have no further damage. It'll be fine. Sorry. So, yeah, login scripts up. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's the logging function. What else? What else needs to throw in here? We do have more we're doing, but I kind of want to close this guy out and make sure you're happy. What type of stuff do you do in your tools that you're concerned you're doing wrong? Well, now. <laughs> you haven't thought of yet. How many, how many puppies die if you use return? How many puppies die if you use none? Uh, puppies is right host. Return, just go to hell. That's, that's just your soul. If you're already planning on it, then go nuts. Yeah. Uh, it will not get you the head office, though. That, that's mine. Add a what? Um, so if I wanted to multi-thread this, 
I would probably just use an invoke command as job. Because invoke command as job will multi-thread it up to whatever throttle I let it. Um, and you're familiar with that, I assume. Yeah, so it starts at 32 and you can push it up as high as, as your machine has capacity for. Uh, I would probably do that. Now, if you're getting into super complicated stuff, then you might look at things like run space factory or, or there are some other techniques folks use. Um, but just on a simple day-to-day -day basis, I would use invoke command with, with minus as job. And if you're, in an, if you're in an environment and you're like, yeah, but we don't have remoting enabled, uh, you grow up. <laughs> or, or quit, and I'm not joking, because you work for Luddites and that's not safe. Uh, remoting is, is a flat mandatory piece of the platform now. Just like, you know how you were allowed to enable a remote desktop because of its high level of security and efficiency? <laughs> right? So. Take, make the same argument and then turn off RDC. You can make that the trade with the InfoSec guys. I'll let you turn off RDC. Um, but yeah, I would probably use invoke command. What I would not do, I would not modify my function to have its own multi-threading because that's it doing two things. And that means I'm going to be adding code to this that I'm almost certainly going to use somewhere else. So if I, if I had some other technique for threading that I wanted to use, I would write that as an its own set of tools that anything could be fed to. So it's nice and modular and task separated. So Don, if you knew that this was going to run against, you know, if you knew the tool was going to be purposely run against a large volume of endpoints or whatever the tool is for, you would not put the, the threading in there just to... If I, knew that, if I knew this was going to be run against a bunch of bunch of computers, I would not add threading to this. I would have something else that handled the threading that could take this as one of its arguments, like invoke command or whatever. Yeah. And the reason for that is whatever I'm doing to do that threading is going to get used on a lot of things. And I don't want it embedded here and there and there and there. I want it in its own self-contained set of tools, like the job commandlets. That's why they exist. Okay, so we're, we, we're, we're sending a bunch of functions to a jump server, yep. which is then reaching out to a bunch of other machines to do stuff to them. Yep. Okay? Um, and what, what, what I do is uh, basically you have to do like a dot um, PS1, um, and I invoke that on the session on the remote, each remote computer to make those modules, uh, sorry, to make those functions available on, in each remote session. Sure. Um, is, do you think that's a fine approach, or is there a better way to handle it? Yeah, so, so you are you're on your jump server. You are invoking a command, and that command is the script that contains all the functions to get those functions live in the remote session. Yes. Yeah, that's how you do that. Okay. Alternately, you could package those functions into a module and deploy it, but, but that's a step. That's what I was trying to get around. Yeah. And then it has, well, yeah. So... I, I think in, in Microsoft's perfect world, let me, let me give you two alternatives, not necessarily better, just alternatives. In Microsoft's perfect world, which we're not, at, we're not at yet, you have some internal repository that PowerShell get can run against. And you store all your modules in that repo. So, you know, maybe it's a chocolate and nougat repo or something like that, right? You tell the remote machine, install dash module the it hits the repo, pulls the module down, and you're good to go. Because then you can always tell the machine, hey, update module. And it knows where to go to get it, right? And we know that model works because Unix has been doing it forever, right? Every Unix machine ever always has worked that way. They've got apt-get and yum and, and rpm and all this other crap. Well, that's what PowerShell get is for us. That's the perfect world. The reason we're not quite there yet is because a lot of companies aren't quite to the point where they're ready to spin up their own NuGet repos. And we don't have a lot of good PowerShell get providers other than NuGet right now, but we will, right? So just right on the edge. 
So that's option one. That's the Brave New World. And incidentally, PowerShell Get is not just version five. You guys know that, right? PowerShell Get itself was, was backported to at least three. Good. Not the file version. I mean, option two, I don't want to get into that. I'm still on option two. I have a lot of caffeine. Um, um, uh, option two. Option two, you could kind of do something a little bit similar. If you packaged your functions into a module, right? And, and let me know if I go off the rails here. Put the module on your jump server, right? That's one point of maintenance for that module. Tell the remote computers to import that module via re implicit remoting. Now that means the module is still going to execute on the jump server, so that might not achieve the execution environment you're after, but it's another way to do it. Well, you'd have to get all crazy with authentication, yeah, because you'd, you'd it'd be like a triple hop minimum. But yeah, that's another option. The, the ideal way is, is the, the, the PowerShell get. Good questions. All right, now what? Uh, earlier you told someone that the, uh, the file repository wasn't done. Oh, yeah, I, the, the, the file repository has been a little brokey for me. I have not gotten it to work right. Well, excellent. Well. Uh, Good. I'm not. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know, it, getting the initial packages was the hard part for me. Yeah, well, I mean, if, in his case, he's creating packages, so getting them is, is not a big deal. It's just a zip file for that. Um, but yeah, the ideal world is PowerShell get. Now, that's, that's like a pre-deployment thing, right? Because you've got to get the PowerShell get itself on all those boxes. That is a worthy project. You want to do that. How about the DSC file resource? Yeah, well, if, if DSC becomes on the table, then, then it's a whole different universe, right? I, I'm, I'm absolutely a fan of use the file resource to bring code over, but if you're managing the servers with DSC, then you're not gonna be pushing out procedural functions to make them change themselves. You're gonna go full hog with DSC and, and that whole stack, which is what you will eventually do whether you like it or not, but since you're here and not over there, We'll just pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a hybrid of doing PowerShell and doing a pre-deploy and then using the DSC afterwards. PowerShell for a pre, pre yeah, sure. Should just, you, know, you should just do it all in DSC, yeah. Yeah, but I, I, you know, baby steps. I get it. All right, what else? Do you want to do the next one? Yeah? You sure? Yeah. You don't seem sure. All right. So, do, 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 do. Um, how often... Shout out numbers. How often do you, do you make your users change their passwords? 60 days. 90, 60, 45. Any 30s? A couple 30s. Any 15s? Um, at Bell, we just we left it on unlimited unless we knew an auditor was coming, and then we in because telecom. Um, how often do you change your service passwords? About the same. About every 45 days. Oh, oh. Because it's a pain in the neck, right? Uh, now, first of all, as a preface to this, you guys do know about managed service accounts, right? Does anyone not know about them? Okay. Um, if you can use MSAs, use them. Now, not every service is, is capable of that, so I get it. But let's look at something here. Um, just for fun, we are going to use WMI, the old DCOM style, instead of SIM, just so we can be a little bit different. I'm going to do a get WM object uh, class Win32 service and just pipe it to GM. So we've got a method on this dude called change. Got a couple methods. Change lets you change every single thing about the service. You can change its display name, its startup type, the user account it uses, its password. And so it takes this enormous string of parameters and for everything you don't want to change, you give it a null and then you only provide a new value for the thing you do want to change, okay? It goes something like this. Um, first of all, uh, I'm just gonna get one service. Get WMI object, win32 service, filter, name, 
equals bits. Uh, I mess with bits in class because it won't break my lab machine. This is the background intelligent transfer service. This is what pulls down Windows updates. So don't just go dorking around with this in production, right? I can do this and it will not significantly affect my VM right here, right now. That's it. Bits dot change. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Also, bits normally runs a system account, so it doesn't have a password, so this will break it. Okay, just so we're clear. So did you get all that? You can look this up, by the way, if you punch win32 underscore service into the Goog or the Bing, uh, it'll have the doc page and you can look at the change method and it'll tell you what each of those nulls is doing. Cool? So we hit enter. You get an object back. The object will have a return value of zero if it worked. If it is non-zero, it did not work. And there's a couple of the non-zero values that are documented. So, let's just grab that. Function set service password param. What's first? What's the first parameter? Service name. Service name. We need that, right? Uh, it's a string service name. What's next? Huh? Computer name. That should be mandatory too. Man, mandatory. Maybe we're going to take this from the pipeline, yeah? Seems likely. Value from pipeline. We'll just do by value. This is probably going to be multiples. What's next? Password. Just to uh, make it a little clearer. Oh, no. oh, no. you got to make that a secure string, otherwise the PS script analyzer is never going to let this pass. I have to. I don't have to do anything. Let's be clear. <laughs> I had to do things when I was 12. Not anymore. Good? That's all we need, right? So it's not a trick question. Ah, uh, if we're doing a set. Supports should process equals true. You are also supposed to provide a confirm impact. Confirm impact is one of three string values, low, medium, high. Here's what it means. In the shell, there is a confirm preference variable. Every time you start the shell, it is at high. If you run a command with a confirm impact equal to or higher than confirm preference, then the minus confirm switch is automatic. So in this case, if I specify a confirm impact of low or medium, it will not ask me, are you sure, automatically. So I'm going to specify medium. What you're supposed to do with this is kind of use your best judgment of how bad will it be if this goes wrong. And I think that's about right. This is recoverable, right? If we screw this up, we can fix it. It's not impossible to fix. It's not going to immediately wipe out the environment. The service is still running. It's already logged in. It's not until the next time the service starts that it would become a problem. And hopefully by then, we'll be on like a different job. <laughs> <laughs> so, get resume out printer. Ah, damn it. Ah. So, then what does confirm does when you have mean, high, or low? What does it do? Using minus confirm has nothing to do with medium, high, or low. See, my confirm preference is set to high over here. Jiggle your head. Yes. Okay. If I set this to high and I run this, because it is the same or higher than my preference, this will automatically run minus confirm. I don't have to type minus confirm. 
if I set it to medium, now it will not automatically confirm. I'll have to type minus confirm if that's what I want. Now it will automatically confirm because it is equal to or higher than my preference. So that's all that is. All right, so we've declared support for that. Let's get our, our, our process going here. For each computer in computer name. By the way, um, if any of you are also fans of this, this is another use of comments we haven't talked about. Who does this? Yeah, this is totally legit. You put a big word. Oh, that's fine. So basically, you turn it into basic. That's fine. Big fan of basic, first language. Uh, okay. Uh, let's let's do it right. Sometimes I, I hack through this in classes, but then I get yelled at. Catch. So let's do a service equals get WMA object, class name, win32 service, filter name equals service name, and error action stop. Uh, another thing I, I want to point out, mainly because we are recording this for posterity, is a lot of folks get confused about the magicness of double quotes. The fact that dollar sign service name is inside single quotes is not true. It's only the outermost set of quotation marks that delimit the string itself, which determine the magic functionality. The magic meaning replacing a variable with its contents. Those two internal things that look like single quotation marks are just are just ink on the screen as far as PowerShell is concerned. It's the outer two that matter. Right, right? So we're going to do that. Um, if it explodes, we will failed to set password on computer. OK. Did I get the error action stop at the end? Yes, I did. All right. Now I need to implement my actual change. If, this is how you implement supports for should process. Service dot change one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, new password, end. Result, result equals if result dot return value not equal to zero, right warning, error, what that is, error setting password on computer, sub expression, result return value. I don't know why this is over here. Go away. Right, 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 right. Okay. Everybody okay with the sub expressions? The dollar sign with the what do you call them? All right. So here's what has to go in the magic if. If PS commandlet should process and you get some parameters here. Remember when we looked at the verbose preference, it said performing operation, quote, quote? That's where that comes from. You're meant to provide some indication of the target. So you could actually just put the computer name because if you ran this command, presumably you knew what it was doing. You're meant to just provide some information about what it is you are changing. So take a gander at all that. 
Tell me if it makes sense. Aren't there two parameters? Uh, and I do what? Aren't there two parameters on the shift process? Aren't there two parameters? No. Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll see. Because isn't isn't my action set service password? We'll see. Yeah. So remove module, don class, push save, set service password, computer name, local host, service name, bits, new password. I guess it worked. What if? Performing the operation set service password on target localhost. Confirm. Are you sure? No. It, def it defaults to the function name, yeah. The, the, the practice is to let it use the function name. So $PS commandlet is a built-in object. And it has a should process method. When you call the should process method, it either generates the what if display or the confirmation yes, no prompt depending on whether you ran it with minus what if or minus confirm. If you did not include what if or confirm, should process returns true. That's just how it works. If you call with minus what if, should process always returns false. So whatever's inside there won't happen. If you call it with minus confirm, should process generates the prompt. And if you say yes, it returns true. If you say no, it returns false. Nope. Nope. Totally non-custom prompt. That's just what it does. <coughs> mm -hmm. Is there any way to change? There is not a way to change that up, uh, apart from going into the host application and changing it. Right. So if I ran this in the ISE, I would get a little pop-up dialog, right? So the hosting application is responsible for that prompt. Um, essentially what happens, the PowerShell engine stops and it, call, it does a callback on the hosting app and says, hey, I need a prompt. And then whatever code the host runs, low. You have a question? The GitWi object, did you actually use the computer name? Did I use the, maybe not. Did I not use the computer name? No, no apparently not. Picky, picky, picky. Okay. You guys with your correctness and your code and what else? Huh? I'm not putting logging in now. Oh, how did I find out? I went to Google and I looked up the docs for Win32 service and I've been doing this for 12 years. Um, it, so, so he, is it better to use the SIM methods? Um, let's discuss that for a sec, because that's, that's a good question. The WI, WMI command, understand that th there's only one underlying repository. We used to call it the WMI repository, but now we're just going to call it the repository. We're just totally going to steal Richard's session down here for about five minutes. The difference between WMI and SIM are how they talk to it. WMI uses remote procedure calls, which is distributed component object model, which, which, what ports does that use? Yes, all of them. <laughs> and getting that through a firewall is like getting a baby through cheesecloth. Nobody would do that. It's gross. Okay? 
And now that's in your head. <laughs> You're welcome. Microsoft is not investing any further in that stack. And in fact, by default on 2012 R2, it's disabled, it's turned off. The new stack, SIM, is based on the newer industry standards, uses the WS MAN protocol, which is the same protocol used by PowerShell remoting. SIM and remoting are not the same thing. They use the same protocol. So that's the wireline protocol. It's a, a, a variant of HTTP or HTTPS. It talks by default on 5985 or 5986, very easy to get through a firewall. And this is where Microsoft is putting all of their investment. WMI, the repository rather, the repository is a hot mess. Because back in the 80s, the way they got all the Microsoft teams to start putting stuff into the repository was there was a guy, a program manager for WMI, who ran around going, do WMI, do WMI. And all the teams said, sure, how do we do it? I don't know, just do it. So they all did their own thing, and it was a mess. SIM helps address that by kind of, kind of buttering over some of the, the, the bumpiness of it so that with SIM, as an example, I can retrieve the class definition and it will show me what the method wants. And so it's a little bit better about documenting. Now, the fact is, um, this will do that too. Uh, people just don't know it. This is the class definition, right? Uh, 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 and here's the change method. It's telling me that the first thing is a display name. And if I knew how to expand that, and I do, then I could make it list the whole thing. Do it. Ah. <laughs> Dude, this is like the last of my secrets. So, here, shut up. Why are you so mean? Put on a whole conference for you. So, the thing to remember everything in PowerShell is easy if you can remember this it's always an object where name equals change, select, expand, description. Was it not description? Definition. If you just remember everything's an object, you have, you have everything you need. And that can sometimes be different than like the MSDS documentation for the order. Um, this should be the same as the MSDN documentation. Um, if, if the proposal is that MSDN is sometimes screwed up, I'm not going to argue. So you only have to hit nulls up till the one you need, and then you're good? You don't have to null the rest of them? Or is there really Every, everything else is implicitly nulled. You only have to hit null up to the one you want. That's, that's a pretty standard calm approach. Now, what's different in SIM, like if I was doing this with SIM, for, for one, I have an actual command, invoke sim method, which already supports what if and confirm, so my whole demo would have been pointless. All right, that's why we're here. Um, but invoke, well, let's do it this way, because you got to kind of get sim class, class name, the class, not the instance, right? I'm just getting the class definition out of the repository. I'm not actually going to get any services here. Right, and then from there, select expand sim class methods. Right, and so I've got the change one down there, and so I can I can where name equals change, and then select expand parameters. These tell me the official parameter names. That's important because with invoke sim method change on the class win32 service with the filter filter oh i can't do a filter no there's an instancy instancy anyway forget that let's just do the arguments because it's more fun it's a hash table and you would just put start password equals so it's it's much prettier much more maintainable over time works faster because they've put performance investment into this and it, goes the and it goes through the firewall with no mess if you're using the WMI op WMI there's no way to create a reusable session because DCOM doesn't have that 
Whereas this is all essentially a really fancy REST API. It's technically SOAP, but it's all text, right? There is a way to filter that down for the instance, but I forget what it is. What I usually do is I get sim instance and then I pipe it to invoke sim method. Anyway, that's what that would look like. Well, that was fun. What else? One of the challenges that I see, so changing the service password is great. However, you've got applications, i.e. system center, that you have certain uh, dependencies on that service account that's hard-coded in those applications once you go through the installations, right? So now you're you're utilizing PowerShell to change that, but then now you've got to change that in other places. Well, so How do you find out what those dependencies are so that you can kind of hit all of those? So let's, let's get a couple of things there. First, very few services in their code rely on knowing the start password for their service. Um, take SQL Server as, as an example. SQL Server itself has no idea what the password for the SQL Server service is. It is completely unaware of it. So there, there usually aren't internal application dependencies on knowing what the password is. The only instance you might run into that is with some, some odd wacky services that have some sort of built-in servicing functionality where the application itself is changing its own service password on some regular basis. And I, I don't know that I've ever seen any of that in a production environment. But I mean, what I'm getting at is how could you find out what other components are, would have dependencies upon that service account? Okay, so I got you. You're talking about the account, the user account. Yes. So let's say, I'm, let's say I'm running 12 services with the same account, despite every single human being ever telling you that's a bad idea. And... I want to make sure I'm picking it up everywhere it's being used. The only way to do that is to go query your entire environment and ask every single service, what is your start account? You'd have to write a tool to go do that. And you'd have to touch every single machine. And it is a huge maintenance problem and Microsoft knows it and that's why they introduced managed service accounts so that they can be more self-maintaining. Um, What's that? Group managed service. Group managed service. Yeah, that, that's yes, that's the idea. And it makes the service more. Do you, so, do you guys know how the, the MSAs work at a basic level, right? Your computer has a password in Active Directory. You know that, right? Computer account password. How often do you change that? No. Never. And you never know what it is, but the computer changes it on a regular basis. That's all a managed service account does. The service checks in with Active Directory, changes the account and then updates itself, and then it's all good to go. And that way you just, you never need to know what it is. But yeah, if you've got a service account that's being used in you know 12 different spots and you're not sure what those 12 are, you're going to have to go spelunking. There are, there are people who will sell you tools that will make that a lot easier. Um, Dell probably bought them. Did they? You like Service Explorer? They quit supporting it? Something like that, yeah. That's not surprising. Michael's a whatever. He's busy buying EMC. What else? Ideally, this would take an input of something more secure. Ideally, this might take an input of something more secure. Eh, maybe. Depends on the context you're going to use it. Right, like if you're just if you're just running it ad hoc, then then who cares, yeah. right? It's just you, you have to type it somewhere anyway. You might as well type it here. If it's going to be part of a controller that that the password is going to have to get stored somewhere, yeah, maybe you yeah. You, you might. But what I would like desire, like I really don't care to know my SQL Server password. I would create a run book somewhere that would just generate this for me and go change it. Y yeah, exactly. So, and if the runbook is generating it and it's not living anywhere, then it's fine for the runbook just to pass it to clear text to this because you're in the same process space. Yeah. Um, it, maybe you're querying it out of a database. You know, some configuration. It, it kind of depends. If the, obviously, if the password's going to be at rest somewhere, then yeah, it, it should be it should be secured in some fashion. If it's going to be generated 
and not live at rest anywhere, then no. It, at the end of the day, it has to be clear text when it goes over the wire, which means we're all using HTTP S for our remoting, our WinRM setup, right? We're not using HTTP because we're not dumb. Um, if RPCs, it's going to be clear text. There's just no way to stop it. Is there a way with on that uh, new password you can specify to accept either type or you? Uh, e either type of what? Well, a string or a secure credential. Yeah, I could I could code I could code two different new passwords one that accepted a string and one that accepted a credential. The point is the other end of this doesn't want a credential. It only wants a string. We're using an old technology that has no clue what a PowerShell credential object is. So at the end of it, I'm transmitting a clear text password across the wire. That's the only way the technology works. Okay. So there's not a lot of sense in going through permutations to encrypt it on the front end. Okay. Now, again, if it has to sit at rest somewhere in a configuration database, Secure that with who can get to it, encrypt it as it sits on. You know, you do all the things to secure it, but that's separate. Or someone's looking over your shoulder and it. Well, get a better cube. <laughs> you know, <laughs> bigger cube balls. The W the WMI service doesn't know how to decrypt it though. Yeah, I know. So yeah, the the right thing to do. Sim, with HTTPS. Um, yeah, it, it depends how you set the credential in Active Directory, whether you would be passing it a credential object. Typically, you don't actually <coughs> pass a credential object. If you were using set AD account password, it's a secure string. Okay. But you would need to know the clear text. You would then generate a secure string. Within whatever function I built for that. In here, right here. Send it to Active Directory and then use the clear text version to update the service. Yeah. You could actually Yeah, but I want to make sure you guys aren't over-engineering things to no purpose whatsoever, right? We could do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, the lowest common denominator is your security weak link. Don't create some more impressive looking front end because you're lying to people, <laughs> right? It's going to be a clear text string. You may as well leave it there so everybody can honestly see the whole way through what's going on. The only way to secure this in flight is with the protocol because that's what has to be passed to the technology. Don't put this big metal shield around something that actually is very insecure. Would it still end up being a, a, a string in a script block logging? Would it still end up well, being yeah. a string if you were it's doing script block text. logging? Yes. So plain text. The way I've written it here, yes, it would be plain text. Once it hit that service. Once it was in the parameter. Yeah. It would get logged as plain, yes. Okay, so you're still in the event log. Event. Yes, it's going to go in the event log that way, yes. Still cringing on saying it's hitting 2500. Still cringing about what? Saying it's hitting 2500 servers has a lot of nulls to go over the wire. Um, yeah, but nulls are free. That's the point of a null. It's only this big, they're little. <laughs> um, no, actually, again, because this is DCOM, Every one of the parameters, and there's a bunch more than I've typed here, every one of the parameters has to be set to something because it's a method. So again, sim, sim doesn't make you do that, right? Because it flights across the wire and then gets constructed into a method on the, other, on the, of the local end. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons to do sim. Um, would SIM be able to handle an encrypted string? No. No, because on the other end, you're still dealing with 1980s technology when we didn't fear things and there was no internet. Would you do a validate set on your service name here or in your controller? Would I do a validate set on the service name? You mean to make sure it was a valid service name? Well, even if there were certain services you did not want. You know. Oh, if I wanted to put some kind of restriction around it? Um, I don't know, put it wherever you want. That's kind of business logic. I mean, if, if this is going to be the main point of making the change, you typically want to have your enforcement at the lowest possible point, which would be here. So if there's some services you wanted to lock out, 
Um, honestly, I'm not sure I would ever bother doing that just because it would be so easy for me to pop this open and change it if I was being malicious. So all you're really preventing me from doing is making a stupid mistake. And that's an HR problem. And you should let them. Unfortunately, I have operations members who HR doesn't care if they make stupid mistakes and they violate company policy. Well, then you shouldn't worry about that either. It's not your company. <laughs> and just tell them, why did you let him mess this? Hey, not my monkey, not my circus. What else? Yeah, we're, I'm not gonna, yeah. The logging gets to be boilerplate. Honestly, on, on my main machine, I've got a couple of snippets that do all my logging stuff. Yeah. So. I guess if you wanted to reset multiple services at the same time, you just, in the controller, handle that. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I would set multiple services at the same time. For one, every single one of them is already gonna be a call to WMI. So it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if I run this command 10 times in a row, once for each service, it's the same number of hits. If you're talking SIM potentially, but then you have to decide what your input's gonna look like, and it's probably gonna be a hash table, yeah. like service name equals password, service name equals password. Um, you have to decide how much you're saving versus how much complexity you're introducing. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, if, if, I, if I wanted to do password validation, I would probably do a, like a validate regex or something like that on the parameter. So the XML files, the PS1 XML files, can they be signed so they can't be changed? Can a PS1 XML file be signed? Yeah, I showed you the Microsoft one that was oh, signed. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah and you would use set authentic code signature with a, a, a class three code signing certificate. Uh, same as you would use for signing a script. Yeah, and then if somebody if somebody mutzed with it, then it would break and not run. What about accepting a service object? Uh, what about accepting a service object? Yeah, you could do that. Um, and the way you would do that, that's actually a good little. So uh, do I still have my get member? Yep, here it is. So the 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 the, the the data type on this is this this dude, right? And so that's what would go in square brackets for your input parameter. And then it, it will let you get one of these and pipe it in and you could bind it by value. Probably need a little better uh, output as it didn't it look like it ran or didn't run. Like you're handing off some dude. Well, oh, so you mean when I ran it and it worked, it like didn't do anything? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing. It's a good point. Except that's the way Power that's the way PowerShell always works. No news is good news. Right? I'll give you a good example. Now well, let's see. What do you think the output will be apart from some errors for access denied? No news is good news. On the other hand, you would be completely justified putting some right verboses in here. So if somebody was running this and was kind of a nervous Nelly and just wanted to see that something was happening, yeah, that's what verbose is for. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm typically a big fan of putting in verbose stuff because I know people like to get that warm, fuzzy feeling. I actually put in a, a suggestion back when we were still on connect.microsoft.com before they moved to user voice that they alias it to write dash warm and fuzzy. Just so people were clear about what it was for. Yeah. They didn't do that. Well, you're mentioning things in output. So, like, make or, you know, create directory does produce output. Uh -huh. And so, my question is do you have a preference as far as your favorite way to suppress output? Do you cast a void? Um, so, do I have a favorite way of, of suppressing output? Um, I'll take that last. My preference is to never produce output on an action script. So if the verb is get or something like that, then yeah, output. If it's an, an action, a, you know, a set, a, a, a new, because new AD object does it too. I don't. My preference, and the pattern that Microsoft kind of established and then didn't bother telling anyone about, is you're supposed to support a minus pass-through parameter. 
So if I did new AD object, blah, 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 minus pass through, output the object you just created. And some of the AD commands actually do work that way. Uh, if I don't give you minus pass through, don't do anything. However, uh, if I'm in a world where something is producing output and I don't want it, I use out null. It's more, it's more pipeline-y, PowerShell-y, and that's just my personal preference. Um, I don't have a strong history in programming languages that do front-of-line casting, i.e. everything but basic, um, because I programmed in basic. So I pipe it to out null. I see lots of people just do the square bracket void. It's, it's fine. Um, they're, they're just as quick. Yeah, one is like one is like eight nanoseconds faster than another. Yeah. How can you tell if WinRM is configured to use HTTPS? You go to your Wisman drive, right? Um, so I have connected sessions to my DC as well as localhost. So let's say I wanted to look at localhost. And then you are going to look at the service, which represents the actual winrm.exe service. Actually, you don't have to. The other, the easier, look at the listener. And you can have multiple listeners because they're bound to an IP address. So you can have potentially an HTTP and an HTTPS for every IP address in the machine. It is common to just see this. This is what it sets up by default. There's a lot of folks who will go do the right thing and turn on HTTPS, but they'll forget to delete the old listener because they didn't read my book. Which book? If it has both, just delete one. Uh, if you if both exist and you make a connection, all other things being equal, it will use HTTP because forcing a command to use HTTPS is a parameter minus use SSL. Now, you can default those things differently, but all things being equal, that would be the, the, the factory condition. And you guys know that there's a free ebook, free, it costs nothing because it's free. It's free as in speech, free as in beer. Um, called Secrets of PowerShell Remoting that has screenshot walkthroughs for how to set all that garbage up? Yep. Okay. Because I got tired of explaining that. And you know that you can't use self-signed certificates on this. That's a dumb idea. Dumb, 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 dumb. And you know that you should not use wildcard certificates. That's three dumbs. Dumb, dumb, dumb. They should be canonical single name SSL certificates issued to that machine and only that machine, period. No, the server. Yeah, every single machine that's going to be receiving a connection needs its own unique and special SSL cert. Yeah, uh, yeah you probably do. So uh, in an AD, how many of you have Active Directory? Has that gotten around? Okay. So obviously, if you have an enterprise CA and you're using ADCS, you can hook all the bits up so that every single machine gets an SSL certificate for itself from AD magically. And then you can make PowerShell use it. It's a little bit of a manual process, right? Because you have to know the certificate thumbprint, which is different on every machine. But you can write a script that can go find, and believe it or not, I, I did, and it's in the book, um, you can write a, a command that will find your first SSL certificate, get the thumbprint, and set up. So you can then push that out to all of them via HTTP, set up an HTTPS listener, and then shut down the HTTP listener. What kind of certificate do you need for the server or client certificate when you are deploying this to the servers? This is an SSL certificate. It is not an authentication certificate. It's the same thing you would put on a web server, SSL. So it has a class two web server certificate because this is just a web server. And no, it does not use IIS. Kind of getting back to where you were asked about the service object. If you were to pass, you have both the name and that, how would you do the 
do you normally do um, what is it, parameter groups? So if so if I'm if I'm if I'm passing in service object, right? Yeah. Instead of so okay, let's. I think I see where you're going. Let's take that in a separate file. So let's say I have a param block. This, this is a good question. This is a good design question. It actually is going to lead us to another design question. So remind me that I said that when we get to the end of this. Um, my goal here is to be able to use either an incoming service object to specify the service I want to modify or the server's name. And so kind of, kind of your very basic starting point, I mean, let's not overcomplicate it too much. And I'm just going to put object rather than typing all that. We'll put service controller just so we're clear on what it is. Right? This needs to be either or. I don't want both. And then But no matter what you use, name or input object, I, I need a new password and I need computer names, right? So I would do I would do that. Name and input object are now mutually exclusive. New password and computer name belong to both parameter sets. Does that make sense? I, I can make both name and input object mandatory. There's no point because PowerShell in figuring out which parameter set to use is going to force me to use one or the other. Right, so it's kind of logic. Let's say I make new password. Let's say I make this mandatory, right? And I make this mandatory. If I were to run this with only new password and computer name, PowerShell will fail telling me it cannot resolve the parameter set. Unless you define default parameter set in the command binding? If I define a default parameter set in my commandlet binding, then I would need to make sure I made that one. Like if I decided it was name, I would need to make sure name was mandatory. There's no harm in you marking them all mandatory. It'll figure it out. But it's important to understand how it figures it out. So the other one, oops, okay. The other one goes something like this. Um, sometimes I want someone to use a file name, and when they say that that's true, they need to provide a file name. And I always want some other info and a bunch of computer names. And whatever the logic of this is, if they don't want to use a file name, then, then it will all make sense and it will know what to do. But sometimes I want to use a file name. I see people build this parameter set all the time and it's wrong, 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 wrong. Why? If you have file name, then you have everything you need. You don't need to tell me to use the file. Just don't specify the file name, meaning that might be mandatory and that might be mandatory, but that isn't mandatory. And if you don't specify it, I'll figure it out internally what's going on. What if you want to validate that in autocomplete for things that are only available if one of the other parameters is? So what if you want uh, things like autocomplete for a parameter that is only valid in a, d depending, there's a couple things here. If so, let's, uh, we'll just talk through it. If I've got a parameter that only belongs to some parameter sets, PowerShell will autocomplete a validate set on that for me if it can figure out that I'm in that parameter set. So it'll do that automatically. If I use a parameter that excludes the one that has the validate set, it'll stop trying to tab complete it because it knows it's, it's not in the right parameter set. You get any more complicated than that, and you're getting into dynamic parameters. Yeah, that's kind of what Yeah. Those are a bitch. Yes. <laughs> Those are what he said. 
They are very, very complex. Oh, no, wait till Kirk Monroe. He's one of our speakers. He's, he's like, that's like, he sleeps on those. That's all he ever codes is dynamic parameters, I think. It appeals to me, but I don't know that I can spend that. Yeah, they're complicated. They're complicated from a number of ways. It's, it's difficult for the shell to statically give people help on them, for example. Um, I have seen very few instances where dynamic parameters were doing anybody a real favor. It, it gets to be one of those things where as a software design mechanism, it makes a great PowerPoint slide. But when you get into the actual meat of it, you're like, eh, it's a little weird. Like having a, having a command look and feel completely different in different situations is confusing to people. Um, it's, like, it's like new PS drive, if you're in an Active Directory drive, is different than if you're in a non-Active Directory drive because it's got dynamic parameters that get attached to it by the provider. It's just weird. It shouldn't work that way. But eh, it is what it is. Those are fun questions. What else? What else do you want to see? Not dynamic parameters. I'm not doing it. You could use an enumeration for the uh, ser uh, server, the service names, right? If you add the server name, then you could use an enumeration to show your uh, users what the. I could put a I could put a validate set. To, we're back over here, right? I could put a, a validate set on there. Yeah. Well, but instead of validate set, you could use the dot .NET enumeration for the, to enumerate through the services for you to choose, right? I can yes and yes and no. Um, y there is a, a there is a parameter complete code thing that you can implement so that when somebody types say minus service name, it calls into your code so you can go get a list of what those are. It's not quite a .NET enumeration. That's not what that means. But there is a, a code completion that can involve script. Yes. Uh, which is which is essentially how get service does it, right? Um, the only thing that you have to be a little careful about is you can't, I don't think you should provide value completion for parameters unless you can be accurate. And I'll give you an example. In other words, as a user, I would rather have nothing than wrong thing. Agreed? Now, I can complete, right? This is doing dynamic completion. It actually went and queried, but it's not the right list. It's querying them locally, no matter if I type a computer name or not. And I, I actually don't like that implementation. Yeah. Yeah, because there's kind of a design principle that you know, querying them locally is easy. Now it's not easy anymore. Now it's going to involve, you know, potentially lack of connectivity, lack of access, lack of permission. There's just a lot of, so it's still local. Like app readiness does not exist on the server, I assure you. And yet. Yeah, and so I, I, I'm not a fan of that implementation. It's a neat trick, but you got to be really, really careful about the expectation that it sets as you're designing a tool. I, I, yeah, there is a session here on custom parameter. That's why we're not going to go too deep into it. But but think think about it. be real careful. It's it's so easy to go. Oh my God, there's all these cool things I can do. Let's put a validate. Let's put every single kind of validate on there right now. And let and this is cool. And let's put that. Just be careful about how you're setting expectations and behaviors for the eventual person who has to use that, because it needs to make sense and it needs to have a good outcome for them. And it would be better to give them nothing so that they, they have a different expectation, right? If you're not giving them anything, then they have no expectation that it's going to work because you didn't give them anything. Yeah, we try doing stuff like that with some VMware scripts to like generate, you know, automatic virtual machine stuff. And we put all that into like show like the networks to pick from, you know, it was so slow, so ridiculous. Slow that yeah. Pulling it all off, it wasn't even worth it. Yeah, it can be very low performance, especially when you're enumerating something from backend infrastructure, which is why this doesn't try to. Yeah. If it's not too far into the weeds, what are the minimum permissions that you need to grant somebody so they can do WinRM and Superbell WMI? What are the minimum permissions you need so someone can do WinRM? Yeah, like we have a team of people who want to be able to pull services. Yep. Kind of things, we don't want to do that. Um, so. I played with the remote. Either through or just the net. 
every endpoint has its own ACL. So to connect to the endpoint, you need to be on that ACL. That's it. You can create your own endpoints with whatever ACLs you want. However, and this is important caveat, that controls connectivity to the endpoint. That does not control what you can do once you're in there. So as an example, let's take something concrete. I give you, you permission to connect to an endpoint on my Active Directory domain controller. That does not mean you can go delete users. Where you get that permission is Active Directory's problem. If it's stuff like querying services, that's whatever those permissions are. That has nothing to do with remoting. Remoting does not add anything to permissions at all. It doesn't care what you do with remoting. Its whole concern is, are you allowed to connect? Great. Now, whatever it is you're allowed to do on this box, go nuts. But I don't care. Doesn't GA give you more granular control there on the endpoints? Well, no. GIA, GIA makes it easier to set up an endpoint in theory, except right now it's very broken. Um, it's the endpoint that does it. G is just an interface for creating an endpoint. That's it. It's not any more or less granular. It's just an interface to, well, to do it. I thought it was a constrained endpoint. Like you can do all of that GIA yeah. stuff without GIA. GIA is just a way to make it easier to set them up. It is not more granular. Is it quite difficult to... Uh, is it quite difficult? No, it's very, very easy. It just is very easy. It's in the book. It's, it's free. It's not on Google. It's on PowerShell.org. I mean the free book. It's in the free book. You don't even have to buy money or pay money. That's a thing. What else? And we can, we can diverge into some of these. Uh, recognizing that once you've built tools, getting other people to use them is a legit part of the conversation. So if you want to talk about that stuff, we totally can. The, the Summit is not a standard conference. And for those of you who have not been here before, we should probably kind of, Summit is intended for you to help drive the conversation. A lot of us are going to show up, especially at these longer sessions, with only a sketch of what we want to cover, and we want you to drive the direction. You're not distracting. It's fine. So whatever it is, this is you paid for this, so drive a little bit. So that's actually I mean, something I'm really curious about. Dr driving or? No, no, no. no. The, the question of getting people to use. Oh, yeah. Tools. You know, particularly, so my environment, you know, a very developer focused, a lot of developers. And so I find that putting scripts in source control repository is a great way to get them to use stuff. They sure. Turn them into modules and never use them because they're never going to install the modules, never going to load them, never going to put them in their profiles and stuff. That's an HR problem. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, that's like saying it, it, your developers are, are, are just not thinking about it right. You've, you've not A, hit them in the head. Um, B, they're perfectly happy downloading and installing the packages and the, you know, the DLLs and extensions and plugins and crap that they use in their own code. So, I mean, they're perfectly willing to do those things. They just haven't had it framed in the right, you know, threatening manner. Yeah, tell, put, set up a NuGet repository and, and let them load your modules out of there. To address that, I've got a uh, DFS mount point for all my modules. So you keep everything in DFS on a file server? I, I use group policy to append the path to their PS module path. How's that worked out? Very well. Yeah? So uh, I'll, I'll, briefly, I'll briefly outline what he's talking about, and I'll tell you a couple of potential downfalls just so you can watch for it. Um, I like the idea. So he's got a file server. Right? And you don't have to do this with DFS. You can just do it with a straight UNC to a file server, yes? DFS is prettier, certainly, and it gives you more control over munging around the back end if you ever need to, right? So you've got, a, a, at end of the day, you've got a UNC where you've got all your modules. You use group policy to append that UNC to the PS module path environment variable on everyone's machines. So now that file server is a magic location, and every time somebody boots PowerShell, it's going to go run over to that file server and enumerate the modules there and find out what commands they have so that it can autocomplete and everything. The potential problems you can run into. One, you've got to be a little careful with your execution policy because those are remote now. So you may wind up having your execution policy on unrestricted or even, even bypass to get the shell to shut up about it. Depends kind of on how you've set things up. Two, 
If you've got 978 modules with 3,076 commands a piece, it's going to take a minute, right? That would be true if they were local. It's only going to be a wee bit slower if you've got a good fast network and everything else. If you've got a crappy network, then it's just like, you know, 30 people opening an access database. It's going to feel the same. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not on the inner tubes. Okay. I don't think it's going to catch on anyway. <laughs> so what we do is very similar to that. We do have a UNC path as well. But we've got, I'm sitting there, I've got it up on my screen right now. It's about you know, 12 lines of code that we provide a, a root DFS path. And then underneath that root, we've got different directories. So I've got an active directory, folder, exchange, system center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, so lots of folders for different products. Sure. So central repositories. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of keeping that stuff in a central location. It does make it easier for folks to get to. I have a lot of customers I've worked with that's done it. The, you can run into performance problems, but that's more your file server and your network's problem than, than necessarily a bad PowerShell idea. Just be aware that it's, it's a thing. And that's that's a and thing it's too. Not that big. I only do that with my stuff. I write. I mean, if they want system center one, go download it. But they won't do that. And you can certainly deploy that as part of, of profiles and control that. Yeah. I I ran into a problem with this when we had it pushing out that that DFS share, and the core machine where about all you can use is PowerShell on it, and we had some network connectivity issues. No, you had you didn't have network connectivity issues. You had problems. Yeah. Right. Magazines have issues. <laughs> you had problems. A network problem. And at that point, well, PowerShell became useless. Sure, but you had network problems. Yeah. Right. That's like saying I'm having trouble log logging on to Active Directory because our network is crap. It's not. I mean, we should stop using Active Directory. Yeah. If you fix into, fix your network problems. Because I had I couldn't do anything through PowerShell because it wouldn't run anymore. Well, but that's not true. Y you can. If the concern is I'm going to do this and I, I, I run the chance of breaking PowerShell, which will take away my ability to fix the problem, then you just need to launch a, get in and launch a PowerShell instance that doesn't load those things. That's relatively straightforward. Um, most machines I set up, I set up a custom endpoint that does not load modules or an environment. It's it's dead. It's only for ad hoc stuff. Like I can manually load modules, but it won't do any of the auto discovery stuff. Essentially what I do, I'll set it up and it runs a little one line script that nulls out PS module path. So I can remote into that and it won't know where any modules are. I can still load them, but I have to know where they are and manually do it. And that's kind of like my recovery mode because it's super dumbed down. So yeah. So back when we were talking about um, the, the tools you were doing the demos with, and we were talking about running against 2,500 machines, and you know you were saying, um, well, then set it up in the job because you can control the daughter limit and stuff like that. Yep. Um, do you prefer jobs over workflows? Do I prefer jobs over workflows? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, 100%, every single time, always. Okay. Ask me if I think workflow is a good idea. Do you think workflow is a good no. idea? <laughs> I, uh, I know the problem they were trying to solve. I don't think that was a good way to do it. Yeah, because we got one guy that swears about workflows. He won't write anything about workflows. That is wrong. Okay. I'll be sure to go back and make sure and, and yet, Jones said he was wrong. And the, the problem is, and I filed a bug on this, is you read about workflows, and it's like workflows are fantastic for everything, in curing, including curing cancer. And, and the documentation really gives you the idea that workflows are perfect for everything, but, but they're not. His scripts run 12 times slower than they need to, and he doesn't actually have any idea what's happening. Because the, the amount of under the hood wackiness that goes on with workflows is just like epic. Um, they're not scripts. You're not writing a PowerShell script. It's being translated into a totally different language and run by a totally different set of software that is designed to eventually get it done. It's, it's like System Center. Right? Well, what do you do with Config Manager? Push the button, go away. Wait, how long? Done out. When will it be done? Eventually. Probably. Probably. I like that finisher. 
No, not a not a huge uh, work workflow is one of those instances where I think PowerShell is incredibly misleading, and I think it causes more harm than good. Now, this is different from Azure Workflow, which is a a completely different beast and is probably their way forward. Um, but you know, the WWF level workflow just is a terrible idea. Don't like it. How do you handle dependencies on applications? Well, so so I, let's say it's Git. Why don't you just get the Git get get the Git commandlets in PowerShell? I mean, we could, but I've now created a kind of like that module is now involved. That module is maintained by someone else. So oh. Sort of come down a little rabbit hole there. I don't know. <laughs> Bad life choices. Um, I mean, managing dependencies, whether they're dependencies on other PowerShell modules or external applications, just kind of is what it is. I mean, the, the, you know, if you want to write your code, if it's how do I make my code a little bit more bulletproof so it can at least fail gracefully, um, write some checks in up at the top to see if the executables exist. Uh, you know, if there's a known if there's a known way, like on SQL Server, you can run osql.exe with a flag that just spits out the version information. Run that, see if the version information has anything in it, and then you'll know if it's actually there and you can parse it or whatever. So, I mean, you just have to do manual checks. I, it kind of is what it is. It's the same thing developers have had to always do, though. It's, that's not really that different. You're, you're developers now. You know that, right? Did I mention that? Now that you've done this class, you're a developer? Sorry. Means I don't like you anymore, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that question, let's say like I do a lot of uh, exchange web services scripting in PowerShell. Uh -huh. And I was, you know, I'm, I'm working on like putting all my stuff into a module. So let's say, you know, that module is dependent on having the actual EWS binary. Sure. So you've, you've got a module and you have to have that binary there. It's not going to run. So yeah, it's a well-known location. You should know where it is. So just check and see if it's there. Just do a, a test location, uh, for example. Um, so is that something that you just, like, from a best practice standpoint, like you want, you want to throw an error when the module is loaded? Yeah, I, I would put that outside of a function at the top of the module, and I would chuck up an error and not allow the, that would prevent the module from loading. Yeah. It's just a binary. Well, yes and no. It's 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 just a binary, but it's not his binary. It's a binary that comes with a bunch of other code and needs to live in a certain spot. Does the module manifest have a check for that? I know you can. There's a there's a uh, there's a required assemblies. If it's .NET, you can you can ask to make sure there's particular assemblies available, and it'll sort that out. Um, if it's not .NET, then then no. There's not a just a general make sure file exists check. I, I have a Because they are so standalone, aside from the rest of the, the client API package, I did just put them in the module. Yeah, if if I just included it. If it's a DLL that can tolerate being moved around, just drop it in your module directory and take a dependency on it. Just don't share it. Well, it, that's not true. You can share it if it's standalone, right? Like if if the DLL itself doesn't have 697 dependencies on 37 other things then if it can be deployed via file copy, then yeah, share it. Well, we're talking different stuff. I'm, I'm going to stop the recording real quick because this is good stuff and I don't want anyone else to have it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we're going to take a break in a second anyway. So, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that's great.